everybody. Uh, welcome to the retake of our Rhino demo from Thursday. So uh, as we get started, um, I just wanted to uh, remind you all of uh, just a couple of things. Um, uh, one, uh, we are kind of uh, navigating through um, the first uh, sort of parts of what you would need for the reality on reality assignment via um, the uh, demo uh, lighting and Rhino. Um, so lighting and uh, rendering are two things that make the uh, reality uh, unreality assignment different um, in terms of requirements. So um, yeah, so today we're just going to jump into Rhino and sort of um, start off uh, right when we uh, right where we left. Um, in class, I'm going to do pretty much exactly what we did in class. I'm just going to do it again. Um, and uh, we um, uh, during the question and answer period uh, at the beginning of class, there were no questions. So um, if I can remember the questions that were asked at the end of class, I'll, I'll, t I'll tell you by the end of class. Uh, okay, so um, basically kind of coming back to uh, where we left off on Tuesday with our model, um, you can see that we uh, added uh, um, a couple of things to the boat. We added uh, a sort of twisted um, unicorn horn. We added, which is also looking like maybe like it could be the mast of the ship. Um, we also have uh, these sort of uh, wings that we created on the side of the ship. Um, and then, uh, most importantly, we have this sort of uh, introduction of walls and a floor. Um, now, we made the walls and a floor by um, coming into, hang on just one second, uh, coming into the box function. We made a really big box, and then we exploded it to delete some of these uh, faces. And we deleted some of the faces again um, just so that we could see into the model and so that the camera for when we go to render or take a sort of um, photographic snapshot of our um, of our scene um, that way we have um, you know walls and a floor to sort of capture the light um, and also to you know create a sense of environment do you need to have a box shaped uh, environment Absolutely not. Um, your environment can be any shape you like. So um, jumping into this thing, I think um, probably uh, what would be good is I would like to show you just a couple more form creation methods, and then we will jump into lighting. So as far as form creation, um, I thought we could do a couple of things to um, add some things to this scene um, and add some things that might be a little bit um, resemble sort of um, standard maybe domestic objects but also might be uh, slightly more abstract. Um, so the first thing I think I'm going to do is I'm going to play around with this um, masked object and try replicating it and modifying it into other objects. So right now it looks like the scene is grouped and so I would want to uh, ungroup it um, right over there and uh, then I can pull uh, the mast out. Um, and in this case, I think I want to copy and paste it because uh, I don't want to really um, mess with my original. Um, and I'm just going to drag it literally like anywhere uh, right now. Um, so I'm going to do it just a tiny bit of uh, file maintenance. So um, it looks like the room box right now is locked, which is good. I'm going to go ahead and make it invisible. Uh, because we really just don't need it right now. Um, and then we also, uh, I probably would like to just get the boat out of here for now um, because I don't really need a scale reference and, you know, it's just taking up space. Um, it looks like I have a mystery curve. Um, actually, I found this in class and uh, I um, deleted it, but now uh, looking at the boat, it looks like it's directly out of the boat. So probably what I should do with this curve, um, rather than deleting it, is stick it into construction curves. Um, that is actually one of the reasons that I, I make layers um, from these objects is so that when you have like, you know, stray elements or whatever, you know about them. Uh, so okay, now here we are, uh, I seem to have turned everything off. Um, 
Let me turn that boat back on. So it looks like our uh, sort of mast object stayed with the, the layer that it was already on, which makes total sense. Um, so I'm just gonna take it and grab it and put it on the default layer uh, so that we can turn the boat off and have this thing stay on. Uh, so here we are. Um, I think probably uh, just as sort of a matter of um, sanity, I'm gonna get this a little bit close closer to the origin point, um, just for the sake of zooming and numbers being small uh, when we go to change it and move it and all that stuff. So, okay, so I just happen to stick it right on zero, zero. It, you don't have to do that. It's not totally necessary. It just makes things nice. Um, and here, I think I'm just gonna move into perspective view and do a zoom selected. Um, just so I can kind of, you know, get my workspace uh, where I want it before I start trying to do stuff. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make a modification to this thing. Um, and then we'll think about, you know, maybe making some groupings of it. So the modification that I'd like to try for now, you can see it already has like a really pronounced um, twist to it. Um, I think I'm going to use something from, from uh, a similar to the twist menu. I'm going to try the bend function. Um, and again, I mentioned that all four of these um, forms, uh, well, actually all of them, are able to be uh, kind of operated on to solids. So these are all things that you can do to any solid. So when you uh, start the uh, function, oh, and by the way, um, I am recording from home, so I just wanted to apologize in advance. Um, the possibility for cat sound is, is high. All right, so I'm zoomed in here, and um, uh, I'm just going to uh, start it, um, you know, in the center of the thing. It just so happens I have zero, zero right here, which is one of the reasons why I stuck it there. Um, and uh, then uh, for the end, I'm just going to go up to the top of the the top of the form it could be you know you could get it right on the top that would be kind of nice um and then you get most of our action here is going to happen in the front view so let me um then you basically get the opportunity to bend this thing now you can this um sort of point that hovers back and forth is actually sort of where in the piece the bend happens so the further you move it to the tip, the more uniform of a bend you're going to get. And the further back you go on the form, the bend is going to be kind of uh, compressed into just the, the bottom part of the shape. Um, I actually really like the look of the uniform bend um, for this, or maybe close to uniform. Eh, like right there. Oh, that looks nice. Um, and... Uh, yeah, now you may notice that I have the copy tool enabled on my uh, function here. And there are lots of tools in Rhino that have that copy button. Well, let me show you real quickly what happens when you, um, when you use that copy button. So you can actually generate copies um, of what you're doing, kind of, um, one after the other. So, uh, and it, it copies your file and does the thing. So, um, a rotate is one of the functions that has this copy feature and it's, it's pretty cool. It's pretty useful. Um, especially if you're trying to create some sort of like iterative grouping like this, where you have things sort of happening, uh, you know, multiple times uh, to kind of create a sense of rhythm or a sense of kind of unity to the form. Um, so, okay, great. We have this thing now that looks, I don't know, kind of like a bunch of grass or something maybe, or like hair. I, I mean, mm, in, interpretation uh, can go many places in this case. I'll bring back the boat real quickly. So we'll kind of zoom out. And, uh, yeah, so, so now we've got this, this thing, and I want to actually make groupings of these groupings. 
um, to sort of like take this to the next level where it's really kind of having a stronger presence in the space. Um, so I think probably bringing the room box, room box back at, that's a tongue twister, at this um, juncture would probably be a good idea because, um, you know, if I'm going to start thinking about how things are placed in the space, it's a good idea for the space to be available to me. So probably um, I think that these poly surfaces uh, should get grouped. So uh, I'll just grab them and group them by using Command G or, of course, going to this point on the keyboard on the, excuse me, the toolbar here. Um, one thing I can say for sure, I think what I'd like to do is I'd like to take these and I'd like to sort of pepper them around the space um, kind of randomly. And of course, I could do that by by hand, um, and I'm, you can see I'm making air quotes right now, um, or I could, um, you know, just use a, kind of an automated tool to uh, create this grouping based on a set of parameters that I set, like how many I want, where I want them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think probably um, we're going to go for option B. So that um, is called an array. And it's over here in the transform function. There's a whole grouping of array functions. They're all awesome. Um, I think we're going to take the opportunity to uh, probably do array uh, polar. Uh, and then we're also going to do uh, an array along a curve. So um, I think I am going to make a polar array, which is basically going to be like where you take a circle and you just assign copies of this object to follow a, a circle. Um, and so probably the way that that's defined is by the uh, radius of the circle. And so uh, we're going to have to set a point for the uh, radius of some imaginary circle. And just to illustrate, I'll go ahead and just make an actual circle. Um, and so maybe it would be something, you know, like that. Um, or not. Um, yeah, and it would, um, and so the shapes would just kind of appear on this line. So we're going to get something like that, um, and as you can see, that radius winds up being somewhere over here. So that's what we'll have to think about. Now, when this, when this rotates um, and iterates, you know, to kind of like fill that line, um, we want it to be pointing in the right direction in advance. And so right now it's extremely perpendicular to the to the room. And I actually kind of want it to be facing the the point of rotation. So I'm just going to rotate it a little bit here um, and just get it off of this like sort of straight axis that it's on. Something maybe here, let me go ahead and I'll just use the room so it kind of points, literally pointing towards the corner of the room. Um, and that seems just dandy. So I'm going to go ahead and make the polar array now that I had that facing in the right direction. So the center of the polar array is going to be maybe somewhere back here. Um, the number of items, mm, gosh, maybe like 12 sounds good, sure. And then it gives you a, an angle to uh, to fill. And so we're actually just going to like take an arc out of this um, circle because we don't want to go fully uh, all the way around because that would populate objects outside of the room, which seems kind of dumb. So, um, so yeah, I'm just going to kind of like get it going um, within the room by doing that. And well, close. Let's see where it went there. Interesting. Not quite. Um, so I'm going to just click this box and try resetting the fill angle. Um, um, and that's fine, I guess. Um, we can just move these into place. So. Um, So 
So we'll just select these and um, drag them down. Less than ideal, I know. Um, it looks like my view is uh, just fine. It just looks like I was kind of thrown off by these being a little bit slanted, but that's actually how they are um, in the top view because they're not being rotated <clears throat> every time that they're copied. So um, I'm going to do another couple of layers of these um, anyway, so we can kind of explore some of the functionality of the, um, of the array tool. Because um, uh, there was a rotate parameter, um, and I want to try enabling that. So here, um, if we made the center maybe uh, like here. Um. Oh, I see what's happening. So. It's because if we wanted it to align perfectly with this, um, sorry, that's like a total dumb moment. Um, okay, so when you um, put this in, okay, so you set the center of the polar array. Um, you've got your number of items, that's 12. Um, probably if you start with the object and then rotate out, um, it will sort of fill it accurately from start to start. But it's actually here, we set the start point here and the object was like way over here. So that's why it started and went up like this. <laughs> I was like, sorry, everyone. Oh. So basically when you assign, I'll do it again, just to be super clear. Sorry, I th um, when I did it uh, in lecture, I, I just did it uh, right the first time, which is funny. Um, Okay, so we're going to go ahead and accept this, and um, then uh, before I go any further, I just want to group these quickly. It's kind of tedious, but necessary. And grouping them. Okay, so... Um, I'm actually just going to go ahead and like set these into the space. Um, and then we can make another one. So I think I want at least one that kind of goes this way. Um, and so let's go ahead and go back to that array function. And it says center of polar array. Okay, so I probably want the center of the array to be like somewhere over here. Um, number of items. Oh, 12 just seems to be working so well. Let's stick with that. And so once again, like if I stick, if I stick the first uh, reference point on the object, then it will kind of iterate the objects within this angle uh, thing um, like that. The ha. Perfection. Um, so now, that being said, um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, select some of these and group them um, so that I don't get into a big mess later on. These are awful close together. Like this one. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, no, nope, that actually goes with the other group. Okay, so group them, ta-ta, all right, so this is sort of like our fake grass. I um, actually think that this one I'm going to rotate a little bit just to kind of like get it into a little bit of a closer spot. Um, so I'm going to just quickly uh, rotate it a little bit. Not that much. Like that, no. Right there. 
Okay, and now I'm gonna go ahead and just move it to kind of the margins. Um, do we need these forms that are kind of sticking out um, off the page or off the box? No, not really, but there's no harm in, in keeping them um, if you want to. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of these just for appearance's sake. So, okay, wow. Uh, yeah, so we made like a lot of this sort of um, fringy stuff um, ahead of uh, what it looks like is the boat. Um, one comment I will make about the fringy stuff now that I look at it is that it seems like it's pretty out of scale with the boat. Um, in other words, like if this is grass, that's like, or even for tall grass, that's like the biggest grass I've ever seen. Um, so rather than trying to scale all of these down, um, which would be kind of a nightmare because we'd have to address them individually, um, I'm going to scale the boat up. Um, and that is one of the reasons why I made a giant box. Um, remember how I said that I wanted to have some room to maneuver? Uh, I was not lying. Um, so just to make sure that we get the entire boat selected, by the way, uh, you can right click over here and say select objects. Um, and then it will just select uh, everything in the layer, including the sub layers. So that can be kind of useful. Um, all right, we're going to make the boat bigger. So we're just going to do a standard scale on it. So before we do, I'm going to kind of like move out of um, the space a little bit. And I'm just going to push the scale button, um, set a base point. I'm being really rough here. Like I because we just want to, you know, make it bigger. So it's not like I have to um, make it bigger, like in relationship to something. Um, although I guess now that I think about it, it might be a good idea to be mindful of the floor um, because we don't want, when we make it bigger, um, we don't want it to sink into the floor, right? Yeah, that'd be kind of annoying. It would just add an extra step to our task. Um, so I'll go back um, to my selection there. And then when I start the scale, um, I'm going to just choose a point that's on the bottom. Um, and by, by doing that, by setting the origin on the bottom. Oh, hello. Go away. Go away. Excuse me, y'all. Now you might see me. Excuse me. I'm going to pause the recording for a second. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. Pardon for the uh, pardon the interruption. As as promised, cat uh, cat arrived. So um, hey, let's uh, go ahead and set the brace point somewhere on the bottom. So um, when we do that, um, it's basically going to set the direction of the scale um, opposed, uh, sort of to the to the bottom. So I can start um, set my reference points there um, and then kind of move out um, and make the boat. My sort of requirement here is that the boat should be at least taller than the grass or like maybe level to the grass. So um, let me just get zoomed in kind of appropriately here um, and then we can kind of figure out what's going on. Okay, so right now um, it looks like uh, not much is happening, and uh, that's true. <laughs> that is true. Um, it looks like one of my points didn't get set quite correctly. Um, I just didn't glance at it in, um, in perspective view. So let me uh, come back in here and obviously select objects to scale. That's this. Um, press enter. Uh, setting the base point. Um, the base point looks great. You can see it's actually on the boat. Um, the scale factor, it looks like when I set the scale factor that it snapped way out to the other end of the um, of the scene. Um, you can see right there like, whoa, what the heck? Um, so um, in order to do that, I'm actually just going to hit the shift key and make sure that um, make sure that ortho is enabled so that I'm just um, Selecting the top, selecting the top of the boat would work too. Actually, 
Um, but yeah, ortho is sort of like this, the way to make sure that you're going to have a kind of what you see is what you get engagement in at least one view, uh, in this case, the front view. So if I set that point and uh, now I just have like a much better time because um, my points are set correctly. So um, I'm going to want to probably um, just make this view a little bit larger and zoom out a tiny bit and uh, just go ahead and set a point up that's a little bit higher. Um, it seems like that works. I said I wanted the boat to be a little bit higher than the grass, I think. Mm, maybe this grass can be just really tall. Um, and I'll make it so it's a little bit smaller than the grass. That looks okay. Um, okay, so that's just sort of like my, you know, design issue. Um, <clears throat> but now that we're here, um, okay, so we're back in uh, the zone where we have these sort of bendy, grassy things now, and we also have the boat. And the boat is now like a, maybe a little bit too big for the scene, um, but uh, I think probably what we're going to wind up doing is maybe just making the box a tiny bit bigger. So there's one other, we're going to move on. <laughs> there's one other object that I wanted to show you, um, an object making technique. Um, and that object making technique is um, to take an object and to poke holes in it. So um, what we're going to do, uh, it's super useful, we're actually going to use the object as a lamp. Um, so first of all, I'm going to get rid of all of these layers. Uh, I'm going to get rid of the boat. I'm going to get rid of the... Uh, let's go ahead and put the grass on its own layer. I can't believe I haven't done that already. I feel guilty. Um, and, uh, again, uh, I'm just calling it grass because I have to call it something. Uh, hang on just a second. Okay. Wonderful. Get rid of it and get rid of the room box for now. So I do want to take like a just a quick note that the room is about as tall as my grids just so I have some vague scale reference as I move forward. So okay so I'm gonna make um, a form. I'm gonna use um, the uh, revolve method to make a sort of cylindrical shape. Um, and it's sort of like vaguely resembling a floor lamp. Um, so I'm just going to make a really simple shape. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, maybe make it a little bit curvier. Boop. There we go. And uh, then I'll use the revolve method to create a surface. There. And I want, I'm going to actually put my axis around a little bit closer to zero, zero. Um, use ortho just so we make sure it's straight up and down. And I'm going to select the full circle parameter so it goes all the way around. Um, now with this form, uh, I want to, you'll notice that right now we have a surface, right? And something that we haven't really talked about before is that surfaces actually have insides and outsides. Um, and so right now this is an inside or a back face of the sur of a surface. So we do actually need to sort of fill it in and then hollow it out um, to create surfaces for the inside and to make it a solid. So, well, we don't need to make it, a, we don't need to hollow it out to make it a solid. Um, it will be solid after we do this, which is cap planar holes. Um, so now it has holes, and then we can use the shell command to hollow it out. We're using the shell command to hollow it out because we want to be able to insert light inside of it. Um, 
So in this case, I'm going to select the top and the bottom surfaces. Do, do, hello. Bottom surface. Okay. Um, and then uh, I already set this thickness parameter in class, so uh, that is 0.125. Um, I think that uh, if we just take a second, um, it looks like the grid, um, the large cells of the grid are one inch. So um, yeah, we'll wind up with a fairly thin wall thickness um, at that point. And so now you can see in the perspective view, um, I'm going to go ahead and shift that into ghosted view. It definitely has a surface inside now, right? And it's also a fully closed object. So that's awesome. Um, I'm going to go ahead now and um, make a lamp layer. Doo -doo. And stick this in the lamp layer. Oh, this can go in construction curves. What the heck? And uh, now it looks like I have nothing on my screen. I'm going to bring the lamp back for a little bit. Um, now, what I'm going to do is I want to poke tons and tons of holes in this thing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the... Um, I think I'll take the box object just to make it really simple. Um, the uh, corner to corner height method is just fine. Um, so for the first corner of the base, um, gosh, I mean, it doesn't really matter. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and draw on the on the grid. Um, because we actually don't need it to sort of interface with the lamp yet. So I think I'm just going to make them pretty small, actually. Um, so that's sort of like the corner to corner scale that I'm going for there. Um, and then the height is something that I'm going to kind of take note of. Um, I want the height in this case to be uh, so that it will pass entirely through the, so that this shape will pass entirely through the, the lamp. Um, and so probably in this case, too long is a, a good thing. So you can see definitely if these intersected right now, it would pass completely through. Um, so that's great. Okay, so now I've got this object. I could potentially use it as a cutting object or you know something that I could remove uh, or cut into the surfaces with. Um, I did promise that we would make lots of holes. And so <clears throat> the next thing is sort of like coming up with a grouping of this single shape that makes sense. Um, and so I thought it would be really cool if we could maybe make a, a grouping of these in like a spiral formation um, uh, so that they sort of cut through the this shape like in a, in a spiral of like little shapes. So let's try that. Um, I can make a spiral. Um, in this case, it would be a vertical helix, and uh, they are down at the bottom of the curve method uh, cur menu here. So, uh, whoops, excuse me. Wrong. Oh, jeez, I'm clicking like a crazy person today. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I'm, sometimes my trackpad gets the better of me. So, okay, uh, vertical helix. Um, the start of the axis in this case, well, we kind of want the spiral to like guide these shapes all the way up this lamp. So we want it to be roughly as tall as the lamp. So the start and end of the axis um, for that will be um, up here. And I'm not 100% sure why it's not letting me click in the front view. I have to cancel it and do it again. Um, I'm going to deselect the box just to be sort of not superstitious and get into that vertical helix. Okay, start of axis it should be here.
interesting. I'm just gonna um, create a regular helix in this case. Interesting. Okay, well, whichever method works for you, um, I would call this a vertical helix, but you know, and it was a vertical helix in, in school um, on Thursday, so it's interesting. Um, so anyway, then you can kind of interactive, once you get the axis set, you can kind of interactively, um, you know, shape it um, by changing the radius and the, um, you can also change the number of turns to make it really dense. Um, these were the parameters that we kind of decided on in class were sort of like pleasing. So um, I think that's what we're going to go with. So I'm going to go ahead and just uh, set that up right there. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to uh, sort of rotate this um, in relationship to this helix. And we're going to rotate and copy at the same time with the array function. So there is an array Fun uh, array function called array along curves, um, and that's what we're demonstrating right now. So probably I want my box to be, or whatever, you know, it can really be any shape, um, to be pro as close to the path, uh, the start of the uh, spiral as possible, um, but you don't have to get crazy about it. Um, and then, of course, I also want um, the sort of length to be kind of centered uh, around the spiral so that when it rotates, it doesn't rotate um, as like so that like just one end is sort of sticking to the spiral. We want it kind of balanced. So um, without further ado, let's try that array function. So that's going to be a array along curve. And you can do this with any curve. Um, so the path curve in this case is this spiral, and there we go. So we got this sort of like mad, uh, mad rotation thing happening here. Um, I'm going to actually bump up the items. Um, they look pretty uh, sparse, so maybe I'll try something like um, 50 items. That's a lot more. Um, we also set an important parameter in class, and that is the orientation. So the default orientation for some of you might be freeform, which gives you a much more kind of chaotic looking result. Um, if you choose road-like, it tends to actually conform. I mean, you can see here in the top view especially, it tends to actually conform to the, um, to the path a little bit better. So this looks just kind of wonderful. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go with it. Um, yeah. So now we have this like big mess of matchsticks um, or whatever. Um, and we basically want to take this uh, gl glump of stuff and intersect it with this cylinder. Um, so what we want to do is we want to take these and we want to group them uh, before we do anything else. Um, because there's quite a few of them, and it could be a real nuisance to have to individually select them. Um, we want to probably just go ahead and arrange these pa this pair of objects uh, the way that we want. And so probably the easiest way to do that is moving the cylinder into the objects. And so then you can start to kind of see how that intersection is going to play out. Um, you know, you can certainly like adjust things from this point if you wish. Um, the cylinder could be even like, like all the way, you know, it could be partially intersecting if you wanted it to. Um, but I think I'm going to go with just that. Um, and so now we're going to do something kind of interesting. So, um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, act, go to the Boolean functions. And the Boolean functions are basically a way of making two forms uh, stick to each other. So uh, with eliminating intersections, which is the key. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and just make a, a couple of boxes just to kind of illustrate some of our options. Um, before we go ahead and do that. Okay, so I have two intersecting forms. 
Let me get them on screen here. Here's my two intersecting forms. And if we went to uh, Boolean two objects, which is the probably best demonstration of the Boolean thing, um, you can now click to iterate through the Boolean results. And so what these are is they're basically like applying logic to uh, decide what to keep and what to discard. Um, so if we click through, you can see this is intersection down here. Uh, this is A minus B, B minus A, inverse intersection, union, which actually will join the forms and eliminate all the intersections. And then once again, it will cycle back to just plain old intersection. So basically, we're going to do the same thing. Um, uh, we're going to use the intersection function, I think. Um, so I'm pretty sure that this actually is um, what we're doing is uh, the function called difference. So um, let's go ahead and try that. So I'm going to select the cylinder first um, because that's the object that we're kind of cutting out of. And uh, if I go to, then to difference, um, select surfaces or polysurfaces to subtract with. That would be all of these. And then uh, when you have this many shapes, it is going to take a second. Wow, look at that. Yay. So as promised, we got holes. So basically those, um, those holes sort of just cut right through this object. So I did want to show you um, a couple of other things. Um, I know we just have a few minutes left, um, but I'm going to take a couple of uh, minutes to show you uh, get into lighting. Um, and then we'll have plenty of more time to discuss lighting. So let me bring back uh, some of our components here, like the room box and the boat. And oh, heck, let's just bring it all back, the grass. Um, so now I have this sort of like floor lamp in the room. Um, I can choose a place to put it. Right now I think I'm just going to put it somewhere like mm, over here, maybe over here. We'll figure it out. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> but for now, um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, set a couple of lights. So you can see that right now in the perspective view, um, if I sort of uh, rotate it around and go to, um, uh, hello. Sorry, I'm just having trackpad issues. Um, yeah, if you rotate it around, um, that we are definitely uh, not, you know, having any significant lighting contributed to the situation, even when we're in um, a rendered viewport. Of course, in the rendered viewport, we're getting this sort of like generic uh, global illumination, um, which is also also called the skylight, by the way. So one of the first things that I'm going to do, um, just to make sure that my render preview is a little bit more accurate, um, if I go to render settings, uh, I am going to turn off the skylight, which is basically this like kind of whooshy, like all over fuzzy, shadowy lighting stuff. Um, when you're using your own light, uh, the skylight really doesn't do any anything. It actually kind of detracts from the, the lighting that you're trying to set up. So all the lights in Rhino are under this menu over here. And we can start with a spotlight. I mean, there are, uh, you know, there are Rhino functions just like everything else. Let's just do the spotlight and then you'll kind of see how easy it is. Um, so uh, you need to set a base for the cone. So let me go ahead and just shuffle things around a tiny bit. I'm going to make the base of the cone um, the sort of like the back of the boat. Um, and then uh, come in. Uh, I make my spotlights pretty large. Um, of course, if you want to sort of like really emphasize something in the scene, you can use a large, uh, a smaller spotlight. But um, for what we're doing now, um, uh, it's probably uh, appropriate if you're lighting the room to use a larger spotlight. Um, so right now I'm setting it up at a vaguely like a 45 degree angle. Um, you can see in the right view um, that 45 degree angle. Um, it's really just called kind of gla like glamour lighting is what some people call it um, or Hollywood lighting. Um, 
and it particularly applies when you have two spotlights. So if we take this and cut and paste it, um, we can basically just move it a little bit um, to another part of the scene. Um, and then I'm going to take this point and I uh, have to quick click it twice to kind of activate it in this way and then I can rotate it. Um, and so now you can see we have two spotlights on the scene. It's starting to look a little hot um, or a little bright um, inside here. So uh, also real quickly, I'm just going to throw this on construction curves. So um, if you have the sort of to bring back the layers palette, you just kind of click through that. Um, let's see. Uh, do, do, do. Construction curves, get out of my way. Okay, so um, yeah, so now we have these two lights and um, you know, when you select uh, one, one or more lights, um, you'll, uh, if you have the properties um, panel open, you should be able to see uh, all of these parameters. And so you can select the intensity here. Um, now, in this case, we have two lights that are pretty much the same. So probably putting the intensity down to like maybe 50% or so would balance them out to what the lighting level would be for like a single lamp. Um, and so that can be a really good thing to do because as you add more lights, um, it can tend to kind of like blow, blow out the scene um, and make things actually too light. Um, you can play with all these parameters. Um, the other thing that's really fun to play with is color. So someone asked in class, um, does Rhino do additive mixing of color? And the answer is yes, it does. So if we had three um, spotlights, one with cyan, one with yellow, and one with magenta, would they balance out? Yes, they would. Um, and it can be super fun. So yeah, I mean, you can use like a really crazy color like this. You can use like a really like kind of like muted or reserve, reserved color. Um, the main thing is that you uh, want to keep the, the hue pure and the saturation but keep the value at like 100% because otherwise if you have the value down here, it's just going to gray it out. Um, and, and that's just um, kind of silly. You're better off just turning the light down. So um, there's one more part, one more kind of light uh, I wanted to show you before we break up. And that is um, the point light. So I made this object that we could allegedly like put light in, right? And so that would be a point, a point light object. So I'm going to insert one in here. Um, I'm going to have to move it a couple times probably to get, get it right where I want it. Um, but you can see lo and behold, it is shining light through it. Um, so that is an option in Rhino. Um, I'm just going to kind of move it in. Oh, excuse me. Not that. So as I move it further into the object, it'll look a little bit better. Um, and you can see, like, you can literally have a disco party in, in Rhino. Um, it looks like it's really in there now. So yeah, we might even put multiple point lights in this object um, to kind of like really disco it out. Um, and uh, yeah, so we'll kind of like move on. Um, into other sort of um, materials and other, you know, things related to light. Um, that's kind of where our focus is shifting uh, away from creating form and more towards sort of um, actually like, uh, you know, making the form look like something real or some material in the real world. Um, I might play with this scene a little bit um, outside of class just to uh, get some things kind of scaled and proportioned uh, the way I want them. But uh, yeah, hang tight. I'll see you all on uh, Tuesday and have a fantastic weekend. Thanks for your patience with the recording.